is in the meeting. I'll just remind everybody who's coming in, if you could please ensure that your microphones are muted and that your cameras are turned off until such time as you are invited to speak by the chair at the appropriate times within the agenda. Uh, and so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mayor McEwen. Oh, and you're just on mute there. There we go. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the regular council meeting for Tuesday, May the 4th. It's currently 7 o'clock. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Uh, uh, with the uh, agenda, we have one small amendment, and that is that we are going to be releasing an in-camera resolution, and that will be on uh, that will be uh, brought forth under 11A. So with that amendment, could I get the recommendation would be that the agenda be approved as amended. Could I get someone to move that? Moved. Seconded, any discussion? See none, all those in favor? Opposed, carried unanimously. Uh, public input, public is permitted to provide comments to council on any item shown on this meeting agenda. agenda. A two minute time limit applies to speakers. Would anybody like to participate in public input? And just a reminder for those who are joining us, you can either use the raise hand function under reactions uh, within the Zoom functionality, or if you're not sure where that is, you can simply unmute yourself at this time and make it known that you'd like to speak. Okay, seeing none, we'll now move on to um, delegations. We have a delegation from the School District 43, Carrie Palmer Isaac, Chair, and Jennifer Blatherwick, Trustee, to provide a School Board 43 board update and presentation regarding the Child Care Task Force. Welcome. Thank you so much. And thank you for having us this evening. We really appreciate the opportunity um, to engage with the Village of Anmore and uh, to reach out and thank you. We're here on special business tonight in that we get the opportunity to thank one of your appointments to our task force and to also um, spread the news that we are very, very happy to let communities know that the task force has actually run its course and we have um, completed the mandate that we were really assigned to do, which was to bring attention and advocate for childcare in the Tri-Cities. And uh, I will let Trustee Blatherwick elaborate on that, but I'm going to do a little bit of history and give you a snapshot of how we came to this place originally. And that was uh, at the beginning of, or the end of last term, actually before the most recent election, we were able to, to bring all of the, um, mayors from the five municipalities that we represent, uh, Port Coquitlam, Coquitlam, Port Moody, and Mor Belcara, and we advocated as a school board with those mayors present to the then Minister of Education, um, Minister Fleming. And we were advocating very vocally about the needs for childcare in our communities. And this was something that we'd had an incredible amount of feedback over the at that term from parents and how they were really hoping for a lot of things, affordable childcare, but also some sort of a seamless day type program where they would be able to drop their child at school, go to work, and then have that continue until they were able to retrieve their child later on. So um, it is it's my privilege tonight to actually share with you that we feel that we have made steps in that right direction because the minister or the um, premier actually in his mandate letter to the minister of education has requested that childcare now come under the umbrella or into the Ministry of Education by 2023. And so we have moved from advocacy or our collaborative ag advocacy piece into transitioning into staff and implementation side of that. And so we're very, very proud and very, very excited to be making that move. So we are formally recognizing the contribution that our municipalities made to this task force and to helping us get to where we are and uh, the contribution of them lending us their people, their, their elected officials to advocate with us. And just as an, on a final note, I think that this is one of those really unique opportunities to celebrate because it's one of the times where we work together as municipal partners and as a school district to really advocate for all of the constituents in our communities. So it's something that I'm especially proud of and especially um, happy to have seen um, transpire. But I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer Blatherwick, our, one of our trustees, and I will let her do the honor of thanking um, your appointment to the committee. Uh, thank you all so much, and uh, may the force be with you. I'm very excited that you guys had a council meeting on this day. 
Um, and I will say, first off, before anything, anytime you want to lend us Counselor Career for anything, we will take her. She is fantastic and has been um, a really experienced uh, voice on our committee who um, has the um, capability to comment from the municipality side in both an informed and compassionate way. So thank you so much. Uh, this was a tough one. I know that when we started this uh, task force, what um, Councillor Queer did not know was that uh, I am a big fan of data and presentations. And there was a lot of um, very intense, very data heavy, very legislation heavy conversations. And she uh, was not only gracious in accepting that workload, but also, um, as I said, was was very uh, helpful and dedicated in her question. So thank you so much. Um, what uh, uh, Trustee Palmer Isaac mentioned was that um, the province has directed that the Minister of State for Child Care do come under the um, umbrella of the Ministry of Education by 2023. That process is happening at pace um, and maybe one of the few initiatives that we ever see that happen ahead of time. However, um, I will say that we still need you and we still need your cooperation and your interest in childcare going forward because one of the things that will be happening is that school districts will be asked to um, look into the possibilities surrounding school aged care um, primarily and um, zero to five care is going to also be um, underneath still the Minister of State for Child Care but um, school districts have been asked to focus on school aged care. Uh, and that will be exciting. Uh, the provincial and federal budgets that just came out had a lot of information in them about childcare and a lot of uh, new directives. Um, uh, as with anything, um, the issue will be when the conversations start happening at the implementation level to see how that funding works and how it will operationalize in, in our neighborhoods. So, but the most important part is that action went forward and it was because of the unification of the five municipal the three municipalities and the two villages and the school district and DPAC and the Coquitlam Principals and Vice Principals Association that the feedback that we provided to them made a difference in terms of them updating the framework and moving this forward. So thank you so so much. Uh, we look forward to collaborating with you in the future on initiatives of mutual interest to both of our, our groups. Thank you. Good, well, thank you both for uh, coming to our Zoom meeting from the Village of Anmore. And thank you, and no, you're not allowed to take away Councillor Cryer because she is a, she's a great <laughs> asset to have on our, our council and, uh, and we're very, very honored and pleased to have her. So thank you, but thank you both for the great work you're doing within School District 43. Can I thank just say so a couple, much. just can I say one thing? Is that legal? I just want to say thank you. Uh, Jennifer, you made statistics and data fun. Full confession, didn't understand a lot of it, but I was very proud to be a part of what you were doing. And it is not often that a task group fully accomplishes what they set out to when they, they form a group. So you ladies both did a terrific job. You've gathered together a good group of people and you should be very proud of yourself. Thank you. Thank Good. you so much. I would just note that we have a lovely certificate that we would ordinarily be presenting to you, but of course we're not there in person, so it's on its way. Good. Well, thank you both. Okay, we'll move on to with the regular agenda then. Uh, we have uh, minutes, minutes of the regular council meeting held on April 20th, 2021, and the minutes of the special council meeting held on April 27th, 2021. Recommendation would read. For the minutes of the regular council meeting held on April 20th, 2021, and the minutes of the special council meeting held on April 27th, 2021, be adopted as circulated. Can I get someone to move? Second. Any comments? I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Any business arising from either of those minutes? Seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Any council member wishes to remove any item for further discussion may do so at this time. Seeing none, then we'll have the recommendation would be that the consent agenda be adopted. Can I ask someone to move that? Moved, seconded. 
Open up for discussion. See none, all those in favor? Opposed, carried unanimously. Okay, uh, and more five-year financial plan amendment bylaw. The recommendation would read. The council grant first, second, and third readings to Anmore five-year financial plan amendment bylaw 648-2021. Okay, someone to move that. Moved, seconded. Any questions, comments? See none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, carried unanimously. We have the Anmore tax rate bylaw. The recommendation would read. Council adopt Anmore tax rates bylaw 643-2021. Can I get someone to move that? Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Councillor Weber. Yeah, just confirming. Um, maybe I missed it. The report we're doing about a two point nine percent tax mm -hmm. increase this year. That's correct. Two point nine four percent. Two point nine four percent. Okay, yeah. just wanted to make sure that was clear. Okay, that's the only question I have. Good. Any further? Any other questions? Okay. Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, carried unanimously. Uh, we now have Enmore bylaw notice enforcement bylaw, parking regulation bylaw amendment, and residential deco program. Report dated April 29th, 2021 from Chris Boyd, our manager of development services is attached. Mr. Boyd. Thank you, Your Worship. I have the exciting honor to introduce to you a new regulation bylaw regarding uh, enforcement of penalties. Um, so, the introduction uh, to present an amendment to the Park and Regulation Enforcement Bylaw to provide more effective park and enforcement and introduce additional resident only parking areas. In addition to this report, uh, represents the Bylaw Enforcement Notice Bylaw for consideration and outlines the residential deco program, which obviously we'll be talking a lot about the deco program, and Julia will refer to that section at the end of this report. So, uh, for the background, obviously, we all are very much aware of Bunsen Lake and the issues that it has caused through the years regarding parking enforcement throughout the throughout the village. And one thing that it came to our attention uh, fairly recently was that we used to enforce our penalties through an MTI bylaw. However, an MTI bylaw should really only be used for issuing tickets to people in person and not to be left on cars and notices. So when we were enforcing uh, tickets onto existing cars, in reality, we, were, we weren't we breaking the law, it was kind of skirting a bit of a gray area. So now we're introducing this bylaw to ensure that it's correct and, and uh, right. So you'll see attached the bylaw notification enforcement bylaw. This is what's gonna more or less take precedence over the park enforcement going forward instead of MTI bylaw. Um, this will allow our bylaw enforcement officers to issue tickets to cars instead of people. So obviously, you know, as we all know, when we get issued tickets, when we've been naughty and parked in areas that weren't allowed, uh, we have um, tickets left on our car. Now we'll be able to do that and enforce them if anyone comes forward and, uh, and questions the reason behind issuing ticket. So that's the first section of the notification bylaw. Uh, and just some general highlights of the, of the bylaw. Uh, you'll see within the bylaw, it includes lots of other penalties, not, not just parking, but a number of other issues. So we've issued uh, um, a regulation that will allow a 30% reduction in uh, penalties of payment and a 30% increase in payments if you're late on the payments. Um, in order for the village to adjudicate these tickets, we'll have to enter into an agreement partnership with, an, uh, with another association, either the, uh, the province or maybe within the city of Coquitlam. So if this bylaw goes forward, we'll uh, start the process of, of, uh, of entering an adjudication partnership. Number three, the bylaw uh, lists enforcement officers who can issue tickets, which include the RCMP. So this is another important part that this will allow the RCMP to issue tickets. Previously, we haven't really had the power for the RCMP to issue tickets. We will. Um, it lists the screening officers that will review the powers and the duties of this bylaw. And there's a comprehensive schedule, including all the penalties relating to the infractions of this bylaw. Um, okay. And then, uh, is there any questions on that? section or do you want to wait? Councilor Trowbridge. Yeah, uh, Chris, when I when I look at the map, I can see the dotted red lines that, that all sort of makes sense. Um, and then I can see some um, some green areas there, which I'm, I'm sure I understand as well. But for all the myriad of streets that have no line of any color, 
um, that they're clear to park then? That, that's correct. That's what the existing parking bylaw has, that they're allowed park basically anywhere where we don't have signage at this point in time. We should also just clarify, if I could interject uh, through the chair, that um, it's still our, our bylaw generally, our parking regulation bylaw says that a vehicle cannot park on a boulevard. So if there's any safety concern with a vehicle that is parked on one of the roads that doesn't specifically address no parking, uh, we still have the ability to ticket and tow uh, based on the more broad language within our parking regulation bylaw. Okay, that's, that's helpful because uh, some, of, some of these streets uh, don't have a reasonable shoulder. And, um, you know, I've experienced over the years uh, cars that are, that are definitely in, encroaching into the traffic lane. And, and that is an unsafe condition when it, I don't really have a problem with them when they're fully off the road on, on a shoulder. Um, so that's, that's an important note. So, okay. so Councilor Corby, just so you know, so our highway bylaw regulation um, kind of kind of defines what a what a boulevard is and areas which basically you're allowed to park within, within regards to safety and what have you. So that's what helps us to then regulate where you can and can't park in those areas. Good. Hey, thank you. Good. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Questions? Okay. Uh, Ms. Halliwell, you had the second part of this regarding the decals. Yes, thank you, Mayor McEwen. So uh, I, as Council had um, directed staff last year uh, to develop a resident decal program to make um, and more residents in their vehicles more easily identifiable, um, you know, in, in various circumstances. Um, and so we have the decals available. There's an image within the report that shows what the, the decal looks like. Um, and really this is just to get council's endorsement on staff's plan for the decal program. Essentially they'll be issued um, to residents um, and, and we're looking at it in two different scenarios. So right now with the office closure uh, by request, either by email, um, email is preferred. Um, we will issue up to four resident decals um, per household, uh, as long as the make, model, and license plate is, is submitted as part of our email for re request. Um, and then when we are open to the public, um, we will allow for people, obviously, to come in and present their vehicle registration with an Anmore address, and we can issue decals that, in that manner as well. Uh, so the idea being that uh, if you have a decal that you can park in the areas that are labeled green within the updated parking regulation bylaw, which is along elementary road um, on the west side near the school, uh, as well as in the lower village hall parking lot, and, uh, and a few spots along Sunnyside Road as well, further south from the Village Hall. And this really is to enable residents to park in an area and utilize our tennis courts and Spirit Park uh, when those areas might otherwise be um, full, of, full of visitors. So uh, they will allow for that. Um, and also obviously if we get to the stage where vehicles uh, driving through the village uh, need to be easily identifiable for traffic control purposes associated with Bunsen Lake. Uh, it makes them uh, more easy to spot uh, for the traffic controllers. And so those are the purposes of issuing the decals. Um, and just to note as well that, you know, the decals aren't going to provide any, um, any specific priority for entrance into Bunsen Lake Recreation Park. There's no, um, there's no ability for us to do that. So that's the piece on the decal program. And I just, uh, Councillor Trowbridge. Yeah, I, I, this um, it doesn't go into the detail, but these, uh, when I see the word sticker and I see the, the image here, um, th does that mean it's, it's, it's an adhesive back sticker that is stuck on your window? Or, or is it uh, that sort of cling plastic that can be pulled off and put on? No, it's more like a sticker that has the, the part that you would peel off on the front and so then you would stick it to the inside of your windscreen uh, and it's more like a sticker than a cling. Okay so this this may be a small issue and I may be the only one that cares but I'm going to raise it anyway. Um, the at Reed Point Marina for example uh, you the, it is a sticker parking program two per per slip or boat owner whatever it is um, but for um, 
families like mine that don't use the same vehicle every day, um, you're, you're able to peel that off, put it in the lower left hand or lower right hand side rather of the windshield. With a sticker program like that, limited to four per household, um, you know, we're, are we mandating that somebody has to, in order to avail themselves of the tennis court, they must take the same car all the time to a tennis court. And I know it's a first world problem, I get that. But, uh, you know, mixed families now have multiple cars. There are, there are young adult cars, we, we have carriage houses. I, I just can see a situation where there are more cars than people. Um, I, I don't know if, if, if that's a, you know, sort of a mountain out of a molehill or not, but, but I don't like the idea either of affixing anything to a car permanently. Good. Uh, I just had a couple of comments and I, uh, and I was sort of on that vein as well. Um, you know, we are, we are a very car dependent community and um, featuring houses that have carriage houses and I, I myself, we have five vehicles that are active uh, in our house regarding with kids that are uh, of a driving age and that. So I would strongly suggest if we cannot transfer these that we uh, double the number from four to eight stickers. And then also make sure that each sticker would have to have uh, the insurance um, either emailed or scanned or, or copied with the village hall to confirm that it is an and more registered vehicle. Um, my other, I've got two other core concerns as well. Um, I think that the, um, the elementary road west, which is um, going to be made as resident parking to be able to use the school playground, as well as the field and the tennis courts um, throughout the summer when the gate is locked, um, I think it'd be wise if we maybe just did half of it as resident only parking and allow some to be parking for other people if they, if they didn't. I, I don't know if I'd be entirely in favor of the whole street being resident only parking. And the similar with the uh, Spirit Park, maybe half of the parking lot as well would be resident only parking and other half would be open to other people in regards to if there's a function or something and people wanted to park there safely. Um, and that for, as we try and suggest like for some of the residents in, in Ravenswood. Um, the other concern I have is just the delay on this. And I think we need to get started on this as soon as possible. So my suggestion uh, to Ms. Halliwell is that we, you know, it would be certainly hopefully easy enough for people just to scan and be able to get this uh, going as soon as possible in regards to scanning their insurance papers in and then uh, a sticker being issued for that. I think that this is going to be very valuable for the traffic control people as they're trying to keep the area in front of the uh, Sassamon Volunteer Fire Hall clear to be able to uh, attend any sort of emergency that may come up. So those are my suggestions, just little tweaks in regards, but I will open it up to the rest of the council as well. Any, Councillor uh, Weberink, you had something, sorry? Yeah, I guess one question, sorry, going back to Mr. Boyd. Um, the Schedule A designated bylaw contraventions and penalties is, that list is that is, is there a bunch of new things on that list some of them don't look familiar well yeah there's there's a whole new schedule this this bylaw is a brand new bylaw and so there's a lot that's been updated and, and yes is the answer there is a lot more new yeah interventions within this that's what it looks like it looks like it's kind of a template from a stand some sort of standard municipal standard is that kind of where it yeah and from? also to represent and our existing bylaws and the penalties that we're allowed to leverage against our existing bylaws. Okay. And then the only other thing I had in the parking bylaw, I mean, I know we have to address the Bunsen Lake issue. It's becoming a bigger and bigger problem every year. It's, it's, I still have a concern that, you know, we're not being very inviting in our village to the odd person that might want to go for a walk or meet a family and go for a walk. It, it seems very, um, you know, if you were just coming up to the village to check it out. And I'd like to go for a walk in the village. There's really nowhere to park. So that's probably the only thing I struggle with. And, and, and that's kind of why I thought we should at least leave half the village hall parking lot to be able to be for, for visitor parking, uh, not just resident only parking. But, you know, I'll tell you, as I do drive by the, the 
Spirit Park. It is amazing how much you, it gets used during the day. And it, it's such a, a beautiful park. Our public works does such an amazing job, as well as the Garden Club in regards to it. It really, really looks good. And it's very inviting. People do want to hang out there and, you know, kick a ball around and, and, and have picnics and that. So it, it is nice. But that's why my suggestion of, of not doing the whole thing is resident only parking. Yeah, I would agree with that. That's any, other, any other comments from council? So we haven't moved, could we, are those, Ms. Halliwell, please. Yeah, so I was just gonna say, I think probably where you were going anywhere, Mayor McCune, is yeah. that, you know, we can certainly, you can pass readings of the bylaw tonight as amended, as we've discussed by, um, you know, altering the resident only parking on Elementary Road West to only include half of uh, the available spaces, as well as the lower parking lot uh, at the Village Hall. Um, and uh, in, in reference to the number of uh, decals, it's, you know, there's, there's no hard and fast, you know, we're only going to issue four. It's just, we felt that that was probably a reasonable number for the majority of people. And so if uh, more are requested, we will certainly issue them. But like you said, we want to make it as easy for people as possible. And with the closure right now, providing the make model and license plate uh, avail us, avails us the ability to uh, verify the the address um, and so rather than you know having people scan documents or take photos they can simply provide us with that information and we can verify it. Councillor Trowbridge would like to give you a big thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thank you. Okay well then with those uh, alterations could I get someone to move the recommendation? Moved, seconded. Any further discussion? Sorry, uh, Mayor McEwen, I think we just need to, there's a number of recommended uh, resolutions uh, associated with a couple of different bylaws. So I might just turn it over to our corporate officer and just ask her to make sure we're, uh, we're following the, the procedure as needed. Ms. Elric, it's, <laughs> it's up to you, please. Sure, I'll just I'll read out the recommendations then. Okay. That council grant first, second, and third readings to Anmore Bylaw Notice Enforcement Bylaw 625 2021. And that council grant first, second, and third readings to Anmore Parking Regulation and Enforcement Bylaw number 649 2021 as amended to include uh, resident parking on uh, half of the west side of Elementary Road and half of the Village Hall parking lot. And that council approved the resident decal program as outlined in the report dated April 29th, 2021, uh, entitled Anmore Bylaw, Notice Enforcement Bylaw, Parking Regulation Bylaw Amendment, and Resident Decal Program. Thank you. Could I get someone to move it? Moved, seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed, Carrie Nasty, thank you. And I know that uh, a lot of residents have been long awaiting this DECL program getting back instituted. So thank you and thank you to staff and for putting this forward. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's really great for moving this forward. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are now on to uh, 9D zoning bylaw amendment, bylaw number 647 2021. This is 2307 Sunnyside Road, CD7. Mr. Boyd. Thanks, Your Worship. Um, okay, so the purpose of this report is to report back and give you an update on 2307 Sunnyside Road, commonly referred to as the Corvado rezoning. Um, we're seeking direction on whether to proceed further with the rezoning. So as you are all pr probably aware that this um, zoning has been forward before under a different uh, zoning amendment bylaw. Uh, it was given first and second readings and it was also forwarded to the APC and to public hearing for comment. However, during the final, the third review uh, from council, council requested that there be secondary suites uh, allowed within the zone and that uh, a comprehensive review was undertaken with regards to environmental impacts on the proposed development. This, this caused a few issues with regards to it already being through first and second reading of the previous um, zoning amendment. So therefore, I kind of recommended that we, we stop that zoning and start a new zoning and clear up this zone and bring a whole new uh, zoning amendment bylaw before council again. So with that said, um, I'll give you some of the highlights of what, what I've kind of uh, revised compared to the last uh, zoning amendment that went forward. So obviously uh, I've kind of broken it down in sections per the zoning bylaw amendment. 
So I'll give you the highlights. So obviously section one, within the purpose, we've added the secondary suites be allowed as per direction from council. Um, the next one, uh, just updated the, the, the table a little bit. I've removed the non-applicable items and just simplified that table. So that's why that has been removed. It's still 19 uh, units allowed within the zone as per the previous readings. Um, here's a, a little bit of a, a bigger comment. Um, so I've standardized the FAR within the zone to point three. The previous uh, zone in bylaw had, had a number of different FARs allowed within a zone. And, and in, in reality, when you zone a zone, there should only really be one FAR within a zone. It's because you, that's, that's basically what the zone is all about, saying you're allowed this much property on a piece of land. So I'm trying, we should really try and standardize that just to one number within a zone. There are exceptions allowed, but it's just a cleaner way of going forward. Uh, so within this, what really changed was there were two, I think it's two existing half acre parcels, which were originally 0.28, and now they've been revised to just be 0.3, the same consistent for the rest of the, the parcels within the zone. Uh, off street parking, uh, I've updated that table and said that due to secondary suites, the two off street parking stalls have to be provided per lot. So what we're trying to ensure is that we don't get our roads clogged up with uh, secondary street um, parking. Uh, the maximum uh, parcel coverage. So the maximum parcel coverage is, uh, is now 25%. Uh, this would bring it into line with the CD6, which is Bellaterra. Uh, and also increased coverage will help uh, promote secondary suites. So again, that kind of gives a little bit of leeway to the developer and how they might want to set up the, the lots going forward, the properties, and give some lower rise areas um, for aging in place and whatnot. So uh, another point here is the open amenity space. It's exactly the same as the, the last zone, uh, but instead of it being shown within a map, we've now dedicated and said exactly how much within the wording. And I'll get into why I've done that in a second. Uh, we removed the reference to home occupation and bed breakfast. I think this was just an historical leftover from previous zones. And it wasn't something that really the proponents were looking for and again, just trying to clean up this zone. So one of the one of the major kind of changes compared to the last time that this came forward, you might notice is the comprehensive development plan. Um, in previous zoning areas, we've kind of attached uh, what I would call a preliminary uh, subdivision plan. That, to be perfectly frank, causes some issues when we get to subdivision sometimes because that plan is a very important part of the zone. The proponent, in reality, has to confer has to con has to basically show that exact plan on this subdivision, which and sometimes that's fine. However, in sometimes the proponent might find something out during subdivision, more information comes forward and they have to comply to it, that they can't meet one of the requirements in that, what I would call the previous subdivision plan. So therefore, it's better off that you, you that you put with your requirement in wording and then show the, the map where this zone would, would exist within AMO. That gives the proponent a little bit of leeway if they want to change something slightly, the proven off is going to prove it without having to come back to say this doesn't comply with rezoning. So that's one of the major changes that we're going to change there. The next one, uh, actually, the environmental report and reviewed it myself in uh, regards to a question that uh, Councillor Wevering brought up uh, the previous amending uh, zoning amendment regarding setbacks and whatnot. I reviewed it and the drawings that I can now circulate, they've established the setbacks as per the provincial requirements. And these will be taken forward during subdivision. So I can confirm that there will be no built areas within the required setbacks. Okay, and then uh, the final piece within this was um, it's staff's recommendation that this proposed bylaw amendment does not be referred back to the village's advisory committees, as the proposed development has not significantly deviated from the original proposal. And the current bylaw amendment still address the comments provided by the previous committees. So Obviously, it's within council's purview to send it back to committees. I just feel that I haven't reviewed it, that I'm not too sure we'll get any real changes come forward. So that's why I put that uh, review by committees. I think that's it. Uh, if there are questions, Good. I'm open to questions. Good. Well, thank you. I just wanted uh, a few comments I just wanted to, um, to just mention. Um, I first want to just thank uh, uh, Mr. Boyd as our uh, development manager and uh, Martin Gregg as our approving officer for. 
uh, recognizing some of the inconsistencies in the initial and, and for their diligent work in bringing this, this forward. Um, I also want to thank and, and I really appreciate the, uh, the understanding and, um, uh, and, the, the del and, and their understanding of, of the delays to the proponent, the Corvado Development Company. Um, uh, you know, this, is, this has delayed things for them and I just, I really want to uh, tell them that I appreciate their, their understanding and, and patience in regards to this. Um, this development I have seen on the books for probably I'm going to say 14 years or 12 years anyway of my time on council and and coming forward i i'm i, I really am quite uh, encouraged by what i see um i know that council has gone through this i know that we actually even had it was one of our first developments that had uh, a financial analysis uh appraisal done of it from jp rollo um they did a, a wholesome analysis basing it on the they did the same one with the infill um we will be getting this was a 13 acre parcel. Um, we are, their developer is going to be yielding another six lots. Um, with that, uh, we as the village receive a CAC in the tone of $493,000. We get 4.34 uh, acres of park space and trail networks. And we also get almost 1300 square meters of uh, Sunnyside Road that we actually, actually are not infringing on uh, private property owners. So this is significant in regards, not a lot of people realize that at Ledlow Corner, this road, uh, Sunnyside Road actually goes through this piece of property. So it's really good to be able to, to sort of really uh, make this make this whole and, and be able to get this under the village's control. Um, I do have one concern and that was on page, um, Page number 52, uh, 9.17.3, and that was the maximum number of building sizes and height. I noticed here that an accessory building is allowed to the tune of 45 meters square. That equates to pretty close to 500 square feet. And you know uh, what we have been very consistent as a council is, is that accessory buildings should and will only be available to those of one acre uh, to kind of give a bit of a, you know, to allow uh, carriage houses and that. So I would, I would only, that would be my only adjustment is that that gets struck out, even though I know at 500 square feet, it would be probably very difficult to fit that into a third acre lot with, with septics as well as the, as the building. I, I just think that we should just uh, take that out. So those are my comments and now I'll, I'll open up to, uh, to council. Councillor Weber. Yeah, sorry, I, I still have the same question that I had uh, last time this came before us, and there's still two trails there that go to kind of nowhere. Um, is there going to be a crosswalk where they hit Sunnyside Road, or is there going to be a connection to another sidewalk? Otherwise, I think we got a bit of a safety issue. Yeah, so, uh, through so through the chair, to answer Council Weber's question, I, I think one thing to, to be mindful of this plan, once this bylaw goes forward, doesn't really exist per se because we'll go into the other map. However, to answer your, your question, Mr. Redring, uh the answer is we would we, we as staff, when we go through the proven officer position, would ensure that it meets our subdivision requirements, which would make sure that you know, the needs are appropriate for certain, such as a crosswalk, another sidewalk in front of the, the subdivision. I think that's one of the main one of the reasons that I want to remove from this plan because. It doesn't give enough information and it raises questions about what the firm might be doing. In reality, they have to conform to our supervision control bylaw. End of the day. Okay, so, so sorry, I'm, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you, Chris. Um, so what you're saying is this is going to be dealt with in the subdivision process? Yes. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm satisfied with that response. And, and also, just to, just comment on the property line to <clears throat> what it would be the. I suppose the and more south grounds where you see that the trail just stops. That's obviously because we don't own the land continuing on from that, but that would be something that we'd love to connect that trail within that subdivision if we ever came forward. Yeah, understood. Councillor Trowbridge. Yeah, just on that last point, we have we have as uh, part of the parks committee, we have proposed trails in all the surrounding land, even though we don't have control of it, nor do we own it. We've proposed that so that if some proponent does come to the table and want to do something with that, we've already got a position with council that we can say, 
know, part, part of the condition of doing that is to make this connection. So uh, a lot of that comes from the park's extended trails map. Uh, and that is for trails that don't yet exist actually. Um, and I'd also like to, to uh, uh, comment that this, first of all, I appreciate you sort of distilling this all down to something that's sensible and doesn't have a lot of superfluous stuff in it that you know is carryover from other pieces. But saying that, I think the 45 square meter accessory building is one of those items and is probably the last one in this entire document because when I, you know, going through the process, when I look through it, that's sitting in all the RS1 lots, it's all the same. So I, I would agree with the mayor that we should, we should uh, strike, strike that one piece. The rest of it, I like. Good. Any other comments from council? See that. So I'm just first of all going to go back to Mr. Boyd in regards to uh, how would we uh, take out that with the accessory building? Uh, I probably refer that to the corporate officer, but I believe we could move this forward. Uh, Karen, would you like to talk about that? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, we could uh, put forward with the amendment to remove uh, the accessory building and structures section from 9.17.3. And I could go forward with that recommendation at this time, if you wish. Please. That council, uh, firstly, that council would rescind first and second readings of Anmore Zoning Bylaw Amendment 597-2019, which is the previous uh, bylaw that was before council. And that council grant first and second readings to Anmore Zoning Bylaw Amendment number 647-2021 as amended by removing uh, accessory buildings and structures section from section 9.17.3 of the bylaw. And Sorry, Karen, is, the, 9 .19, is what 9.19.3? You're looking at the old bylaw. Yeah, it's five point. Oh, sorry. One. I'm looking at page 52 of the agenda. Maybe 56. Oh, it's 56. Sorry. Yes, it's Nine point one nine point three. Okay, I've got that. Um, thank you for that. And that staff be directed to set a date for public hearing for Anmore Zoning Bylaw Amendment 647-2021. Can I get someone to move that? Moved, seconded. Any further comments? I would just ask that staff, uh, please, with as this is a bit time sensitive and, uh, and the proponents from waiting, if we could schedule that as soon as possible, the public hearing at the start of uh, a subsequent meeting. Uh, Councillor Trowbridge. Yeah, I just wanna be sure that we have clarity here because I'm looking at 9.17.3, which is on page 52 and that refers to the 45 square meters. For the yeah. chair, if I may, that was the previous, and I I was looking at the same thing. So that was the previous bylaw 597 that was before council um, in 2019. So if you look at page 56 of your agenda package, it's now numbered 9.19.3, accessory buildings and structures, and that's the amendment that we uh, have in front. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Good. Any other comments? I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried Nassi. Thank you, everybody, for your hard work on this. Okay. Uh, we will now move on to unfinished business. There is not 11A, the release of uh, in-camera resolution. Ms. Elric, do you want to? Or Ms. Halliwell? Sure, thank you. I uh, I've got that here. Uh, the recommendation this evening, um, to release from the in-camera meeting on May 4th, 2021, was that council approve the draft 2020 financial statements as presented at the meeting. And they will be included in the annual report uh, coming in June. Good. Can I get someone to move that Move, seconded. Any further conversation? All those in favor? Opposed, Carrie Nassi. Perfect, thank you. 
Okay, uh, we, marriage report. Uh, just a few things. Uh, while Mr. Boyd is here, I've got a couple of questions. Um, concerns over the grass not taking hold on the new uh, on the new boulevards. Any uh, any comments on that? Or I I, I know you're an, an engineer, but I I wondered if you have maybe a horticultural background in regards to things. <laughs> if you're keeping an yeah. eye on it. Yeah, I can respond to that. Um, yeah, so. I'll, I'll review this uh, in the following week here, and if it hasn't taken in the next, it should really be taken. And if it isn't sprouting, the the I'll basically have the contract to come back rectify the the the, the deficiency. So this will have a re sprayed for, for no cost to the village. And maybe regraded, just raked out a little bit in some areas as well. That would be great. Um, and then the second question I had is about the second bus stop. When is it going to be installed by the fire hall? <laughs> um, we have to deal with some electrical from the fire hall, and as soon as that's completed, we can get it installed. Good, good. Okay, well, thank you. And my last comment uh, is just for everyone to please stay safe, uh, get registered for your vaccine, and uh, let's all get immunized and stay local. So I'll now open up to the councillor's report. Councillor Layla. Oh, you need your mic on. That better? That's better. Okay. So, um, hang on. so there was a, for, uh, uh, a concern brought forward by um, Sandy. Um, can't remember her name. I believe it's Sandy De Shatson. Sorry, <laughs> that was it. Uh, correct. And we had a meeting on the 28th with uh, the RCMP um, on, online and Karen and myself. And the concerns that uh, Sandy had brought forward were that uh, a group of youths had been hanging around on a Friday night and it caused some problems with the, the janitor. Um, <clears throat> so the idea with the RCMP was to clarify exactly what um, situation had been brought to their attention and uh, what they've done about it. it. Turns out that uh, only two incidents have been reported to the RCMP. One was last November and uh, one was uh, just a short while ago. And the one in um, November was where they actually, the use of banged on the window and knocked on the door. And, and if, I can uh, just, if I can just inject, this is at Anmore Elementary for those that aren't aware. Yeah, yeah, sorry, this is Anmore Elementary School. So um, it was pointed out that it was um, the jurisdiction of uh, um, School District 43 um, and not Anmore's uh, number one. And on top of that, the incidents has occurred so um, infrequently, it seemed that it was again a, a part of the problem of investigating it. So what was uh, recommended is that people that are using the tennis courts or around the area of the school, um, if they see uh, youths hanging around um, to give the RCMP a call and they'll come down there. In the meantime, they've been doing special patrols there on a Friday night, Saturday night. Um, school district itself has actually had some of their security people come out and uh, check the place as well. And really the, uh, if the school has any problems, they should be reporting the incident to the RCMP. That's it. Good. Any other council reports? Okay, I'll move now on to the Chief Administrator Officer's report. Ms. Halliwell. Thank you, Mayor McEwen. Um, so just further to what you said, um, registration is open now for anybody 18 plus um, to be able to register for their uh, vaccine through the government website. We've been uh, posting a lot of their links and information uh, so you can find it on the Village of Anmore Facebook page. Um, our village hall remains closed while the current restrictions are in place, uh, which is through now until at least uh, May the 25th. And so uh, everybody at this point should have received their utility notice. Um, we're encouraging everyone to please pay online uh, through your bank or you can uh, pop a check through the front door of the village hall and we will process that. Um, utility notices are going to be due on Monday, May the 
the 31st. And if anybody has um, a, a requirement to pay in person, we will be offering windows where uh, people can make appointments to come in. And so please have a look on our Facebook page and our, web, our website for that information. Uh, and then finally, I just wanted to uh, give a special thanks and special recognition for uh, Ms. Elric tonight. Uh, Ms. Elric is our manager of corporate services and our corporate officer uh, is her title. And this week is Municipal Clerks Week. And we take this opportunity to thank Ms. Elric from the bottom of our hearts for making sure that uh, we're doing everything we should be from a legislative standpoint and a record keeping standpoint. Uh, and in a small community like ours, uh, Karen has a, a bunch of other roles as well, including emergency program management um, and communications as well. So just wanted to say a big thank you uh, to Ms. Elric this week in recognition of Municipal Clerks Week. Good, and a big thank you from council as well. And that's okay. it for me. Good, okay. Uh, we have uh, various things, some general correspondence, some communications from the town of View Royal communications uh, from MAD Canada regarding thank you to the Village of Anmore for a donation that we gave. Um, communications dated April 23rd from the Peace River, River Regional District and another communication from the City Council regarding support for professional news media. I'll now move it open to, I'll now open up to public question period. Public is permitted to ask questions of Council regarding any item pertaining to Village business. A two minute time limit applies to speakers. You could take yourself off of mute or raise your hand if you have a question of counsel. I see Mr. Uvik has, I, I see, yes, Mr. Uvik. Um, thank you, Julie. Uh, through Mayor McEwen, I, I just had a, a question um, at the last special council meeting on April 27th. Um, and, and this is mainly directed to, to all of council. There was a resident that came forward and wanted to make a statement about um, the engagement process, the council's proposal uh, for the regional growth strategy and the OCP amendment proposed change. And he was abruptly cut off. And following that, there was not even any question period um, at the end of that special council meeting. And my, my question sort of, goes around, why would council at a time when, when staff and mayor and council are taking great effort to inform people about their proposal, uh, correct misconceptions and present ideas and uh, possibilities, that when somebody comes forward and wants to uh, say something about the whole process or uh, what they feel about it, um, they're unable to do so. And it, may, and it may be argued that technically speaking, it had nothing to do uh, with the consultant summary report, but in my mind, it's very much related to that. So why would council do that? And is, is that, that gonna be the approach in the, in the days ahead when we look at this thing even further? Um, I'll answer that because I was the one, uh, I specifically said beforehand, uh, Mr. Uvik, that uh, this, this special council meeting was just to go through the data that had been accumulated through the report and we were there just to discuss the report, the findings of the report, and then to give council their initial opportunity to, to weigh in on the, uh, where this path was leading. So I was the one, I didn't want to, you know, there had been five uh, workshops that uh, I'd listened to intently in regards to um, all the information was coming forward. The purpose of this meeting wasn't to further that. We had the previous week, we'd actually had an open uh, general meeting where we did do that. So um, on all special council meetings, because they're topic specific, we do not have a public question period because it is the topic that is on the agenda. So sorry you feel that way, but uh, I did preface that right at the start of it. And as soon as he started going down an opinion, I was just simply like, this is not part of this. So, okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I have Nancy Maloney. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, I unmuted. Um, when we were talking about the new development near the Ludlow property, uh, a thought came to mind, which is in the past, new developments have given no consideration to permitting or even encouraging senior friendly buildings. And I know this is an interest of some members of council. For example, you know, houses of a smaller size, 
no stairs, accessible washrooms, infrastructure for things like grab bars, um, doors wide enough for wheelchairs and those sorts of considerations. And in um, some number of years ago, there were meetings related to, I think we had gotten some sort of government grant. Uh, John and Paul might have been around then um, for having these meetings with seniors in the community. Um, and oh, at one of those meetings, we met a couple um, I think Jody Cook um, oh, knows these or knew these people also at the time, and they were actually ultimately having to move from the village, and they were required by the developer to build a house which was totally unsuitable um, for senior citizens, um, which is the craziest idea I'd ever heard, and I did look into this, and it was in fact correct that the developer could have standards which would make for you know impossible unaccessible living for older people and I think what we would want would be exactly the opposite of that um, so um, anyway I wonder if there's as new developments happen like this current one is it possible for our guidelines to change to ensure that developers can't exclude um, seniors from living in those communities, uh, which seems to be a type of inappropriate discrimination? Uh, it, I'll, I'll try my best at that. It's pretty tough to tell developers what they can and can't build, but I will tell you this, that I think all developers would certainly um, uh, make houses that are easy accessible for most people. I know that in some of the houses that are getting built here because the cost of elevators has substantially come down um, talking to Mr. Greg, our building inspector, he says that quite quite a, several of them are, are getting uh, elevators installed to allow greater accessibility to the houses. I know with this development in itself, this council took it very seriously, the affordable housing aspect and to allow suites and more tenants uh, in our community. And that's why one of the things why this was brought back. So um, I think that uh, council has done uh, great work in regards to adding uh, uh, an affordability index in regards and allowing with the uh, with the carriage suites. I'll just move it on to Mr. Boyd from our engineering perspective. Mr. Boyd. Yeah. <laughs> I would also add that uh, with the slight change of uh, allowable um, area within, within the lot that can be used on the footprint, that's something that I've kind of purposely introduces to try and keep it housing to have lower levels and be allowed to create a suite even which is just all on one level for for accessibility reasons so that's one of the reasons why I've kind of changed that uh, allowable uh, footage with, within the, within a lot as well and then then when it comes to accessibility a lot of that comes within building bylaws and uh, BC building code as well. Is it possible for a given area like Anmore to have um Oh, building regulations, which are in fact, oh, you know, more appropriate for seniors than the BC building code. Like, could we be a leader in this area in terms of um, accessibility for housing that is built in Anwar? It's a good I, question. I, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Mayor. Ma Answer Sorry, Kim, uh, Councillor Tro Trowbridge, do you want to venture in on this? Yeah, it's, it's, I'm no expert and it's a tough one to say, but, but um, if we're talking about things like the Court of Auto development, etc., uh, they're not spec built homes. So they're not designed by the developer. They're designed by the person buying the property who wants to build a home to suit their personal needs. I'm not sure how we could intervene and step in and tell an individual that they have to build a certain type of home, aside from the obvious FARs and site coverage and all that sort of stuff. I, I, I'm not sure that you could, as a municipality, I'm not just talking about Anmar, I'm not sure as a municipality that you could tr tell a private homeowner that they have to put a 12 over one ramp in the front yard or, you know, uh, uh, an eleva elevator or anything like that. Um, however, it doesn't restrict anyone either with 
disabilities or like me that's getting long in the tooth have from, from building a home to suit themselves and suit their own accessibility issues. That's completely wide open and there are no developer restrictions for that. That, that just doesn't exist. You can, you can build what you want as long as it's within uh, the guidelines outlined by, by Chris Boyd. So I don't, I don't know if that helps. Uh, Councilor Weber. Yeah, I'll just chime in. There is a clause in our OCP that encourages innovative developments. I don't think it's ever been tested, but I think Nancy, what maybe you're talking about would be um, almost like a senior's village, a, a senior's community that, that would sort of encourage that type of development. Um, I suppose it could be possible to zone an area of undeveloped land for that type of development. Uh, this is, these are some of the opportunities that could be possible in the Ioko lands. I mean, this is one of the reasons we kind of considered something different there. We've talked about that for a long time, but that's the only way I could see it happening. If somebody came forward with some sort of innovative proposal, you know, I know we've always talked about the campground. It's a campground and what's it going to be after a campground? Uh, that might be a suitable place for something like that. So it's, it's a really good question and it's something that we think about, uh, but the bricks and mortar of how to actually do it are the challenge, I think, especially when you're dealing with private land and telling a, a developer or a landowner what to do with their land, so. This older couple- uh, Excuse me, Ms. Ms. Maloney, I've got uh, Councillor Laidler. Okay. Ms. Councillor Laidler, you're, got, you're on mic, you're- um, I think uh, Ms. Maloney, uh, Mrs. Maloney has got a very good point. Um, there's a lot of people here in Amor that want to stay here. Uh, they are getting older. Uh, they can't manage the uh, large land masses that are involved. They want smaller lots and they want smaller houses. And that's something that we should be considering. Good, thank you. Okay, Do, is there any other questions on public question period? I'll ask one more time. Okay, motion to adjourn. Moved, seconded. All those in favor? Carrie Nancy. Thank you everybody for coming out and listening. Uh, we've got to continue an in-camera meeting, so I will, we will leave you here. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone.